Thank you, um, everyone. Well, I'm just going to turn... Um, this presentation is going to be quite different, I think, to the other two, because I'm going to start talking about um, what it means to an individual sector and sometimes... Uh, and, uh, and, and how um, all of this infrastructure, in a, in a broad sense, is really important to how an, a sector can capitalise on the opportunities presented by th markets such as China. And in talking about infrastructure, I'm going to be using a very broad definition of infrastructure, which includes all the soft infrastructure as well as trains and, well, not really trains, because we use the air, the air freight, as, uh, as Indy pointed out. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so let's get started. So these are the things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you some fun facts and figures about the Australian seafood industry. There hasn't been much talk about the seafood industry yet today at, at this conference, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background to that. Um, I'm going to detail some of the opportunities that exist for us as, a, as an industry in China, some of the challenges that are posed. I'm going to showcase one of our particular, um, what we think is our success stories. It's, um, it's not completed, it's actually a journey that we're, that we're still on, and that's uh, with the Australian Wild Abalone Program. And then I'm going to describe how this program is actually um, starting to build and create a, um, what we see as a more sustainable platform for Australian seafood exports to China. And like all good presenters, I'm going to give you the key messages at the end. So let's start with our fun facts. So seafood is big business. It's the most commonly traded food commodity globally. By the mo it's traded, bought and sold by the most number of, com of countries. And I think a lot of people don't know that. It is worth over 100 billion US dollars annually, and it's mainly traded between developed, developing countries into developed markets. In China or in Asia generally, the fastest per capita consumption of seafood growth is happening in that sector, in that area. Over the past 20 years, it's increased from 11 kilograms per person per annum to about 30 kilograms. So just by growth in consumption alone, it's creating great opportunity for the seafood industry. And fish and seafood is at the heart of all of the Asian diets. And according to the FAO, it provides about 22% of the meat protein for those people. I think, and so do my colleagues in the seafood industry, we think we're the quiet achievers. In 2011 and 12, our exports to China and Hong Kong were about $500 million. And of that, two sectors, lobster and abalone, uh, accounted for around 90% of that. However, we also have other products which are highly prized in China, such as oysters, prawns, tuna and crabs, and many others that are looking at China as a, as a market for their products. Having said that, it's a well-established trade. We've been trading with this country and these countries for about 20 years, so our exporters have a very uh, strong relationship with, our, with the importers over there. And in 2010-11, uh, in China and Hong Kong accounted for more than 60% of our exports, and we don't expect that position to change. So what we basically see is that for food exports uh, from Australia, that what people in China understand about quality and safety from, of food from Australia is all led by what we've been communicating with and what we've been providing to them in terms of abalone and rock lobster. We have some particular advantages that make this um, a good market for us. Australia produces more than 50% of the world's wild abalone, which is a delicacy in China. And we produce more than 30% of the spiny rock lobster. Both industries are, are assessed as being sustainably managed and their quota, their quota fisheries. They're harvested from a pristine environment. And as I said, the Chinese traditional uh, cuisine in China has abalone and rock lobster as two of the four treasures of the sea. So we're endowed in this country with some pretty highly prized products. But being quota managed fisheries, we can't grow the volume, but we can grow the brand value. Last year, lobster from this country achieved record prices. 
We have an excellent reputation in China for quality and we want to preserve and protect that. But we know that to do that, we need to, achieve, to get some really, really good efficiency in our supply chains. We have to do it better. It's our supply chains are competing with supply chains from the US, from Europe, from all over the world, and we need to do it better. Just very quickly, I've tried to sort of put some of the key areas that our, um, our, fish is, our seafood is coming from. Um, and the main message for this slide is that it's, uh, very little of it is, uh, is caught close to a port or an airport. It so it often has to travel far, quite long distances from where it's caught to where it actually leaves the country. And sometimes that's um, around 12 to 15 hours. Um, and I haven't forgotten Tasmania. In Tasmania, we have many ports that... Um, sorry, somebody else did the slide. has put a lot of builds in it. Um, sorry. So we have a, quite a few ports there that have quite long journeys to get from, uh, from those ports to Hobart, and then they have to get on a plane to go to Melbourne or Sydney, and then they have to get on another plane and go to... Um, Hong Kong and then they have to get on another plane to go somewhere else. So it's quite a long, complex um, supply chain. And quite often, you know, the roads to service those ports that are in rural and regional areas are closed or, you know, they're very um, uh, rustic, shall we say, to, uh, and make it very challenging for our, for our guys to get the product from the port. And the ports themselves are fairly rustic as well, if, if, uh, if that's probably the best way to describe it. I'll probably leave that, that discussion for some other time. Um, but air freight, as you pointed out, is absolutely critical to our industry. Most of our product in China goes live, and so it has to be, it's very time critical, as you can imagine, keeping seafood alive through all that road transport and air transport is quite a challenging technological uh, challenge, but we do it, and uh, so about 90% of our exports go by air, and that's not likely to change. Um, I think uh, you mentioned, Lindsay, that um, uh, you had a, 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 a thing up there of a supply chain where I think you had six, you had six stages between um, point of production to the um, to the aircraft. Well, we've done some studies where we where we found. Um, anything up to 80 points at which the product will change hands or change position before it gets to the aircraft. So the fact that it gets there and it gets there alive, I think, is a real um, testament to some of the people working in these supply chains. So now I want to talk to, uh, to you about what we've been doing with our Australian wild abalone um, industry. So essentially, the opportunity for abalone, as I said, it is one of the four treasures of the sea. It is, in, it is part of the Chinese culture, but China, as we all know, is modernising. And, and so we're, having, we're finding that the demand for abalone in the traditional cuisine sense is actually declining. We can start to see a decline. And so the, the aim of the project, or the, or the work that we're doing, is to stop that decline and to try and modernise abalone, make it trendy, make it cool, um, by, by introducing new cuisines and a number of other um, uh, activities that we're involved in. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about the approach that we've got for this project, which is, as I said, they've been working together, the importers and the exporters, for about 20 years or more. So they have really good relationships. But essentially, that's all that we've, we've that's where our, our information flow stops, really, with the, with the market. So we've spent the last few years trying to understand what is happening between the importer in China and our customer, the people who decide whether or not they're going to buy abalone. And so we're really trying to focus on that supply chain on the other side of the, of the in the market. And we've come up with a number of, uh, a number of um, activities. I'm just trying to summarise it here. It's quite a complex program. I could probably talk to you for hours about it if you're interested. But um, 
Essentially, we're, we're looking at building collaboration through the supply chain. So working with our importers to get closer to those people in the supply chain in China, to understand how it gets there and what they need from us to make sure that the product that gets to the consumer is of the quality that we want it to be. We need to establish our credentials, and this is where some of the infrastructure that based people have been talking about, our government policies and processes about the sustainability, the food safety, that's all really important, but let's explain it to people in ways that they can understand and relate to. And so we have a full education program working, and working with our supply chain to differentiate our product in a, what's becoming an increasingly competitive market. And these are, our, uh, these are our exporters. We've got 10 of them at the moment working together, represents about 80% of the um, wild abalone production in Australia. And uh, we've come up with this uh, certification trademark which sits alongside their individual brands. This is not about you know, swapping brands or trying to get everyone to brand together. This is about allowing them to add value to their brands by capitalising on our sustainability credentials, our food safety credentials. And we've also implemented um, some new technology around protecting our product from fraud. Those of you who deal with China would know that uh, fraud and substitution is, one, is a big issue. And so we've implemented, or we're working in partnership with a company called Nanotag. It's the world, it's, um, Again, I could give a whole presentation on this, but it's a, a micro dot that is um, now impregnated into the plastic bags that the product is put into when it's frozen. Um, and it's tamper evident, which means that if somebody tries to tamper with the product, um, the receiver uh, knows that it's been tampered with. So this is all part of our, of our integrated um, information package, if you like, to support our, what we're doing, what the companies are doing to market their product, which is it's an underpinning platform, which is heavily reliant on our infrastructure. We presented, uh, as part of our supply chain education program, we presented these credentials at a, um, at a meeting in Hong Kong. We invited um, about uh, 80 people. We got 150 turned up. That's how interested they were in our seafood. Um, and in fact, the comment from the Austrian people said, well, that doesn't usually happen. You invite 80 people, you get 40. And I said to them, yep, this is abalone. So um, these guys are, are just, were just uh, enthralled, we like to think, um, of, with our video. We've created... Um, uh, we launched this video, which you can download for YouTube, which explains our, uh, our credentials. Patrick's laughing because he's in the next video. Um, which we, so we have one video which tells the story of the abalone uh, from the point of view of the diver, and then we have another video which tells the story from the point of view of our credentials, so it's the Australian government backing an industry saying, yes, this is what the industry is saying is true. We, we can verify this. And this was an important message. The feedback we had from our Hong Kong seminar was that was just absolutely, incredibly vital. It, was, uh, for, for, it wasn't just us saying, it wasn't just marketing spin, we had the government backing, so it was particularly successful. And a bit of a bonus, because of all of that, WWF have now listed us as green in their sustainable seafood guide for Hong Kong. So it's been a real bonus for us doing this. So that's just a quick journey through a fairly large and complex project that we're working on to improve our abalone exports to China. But in terms of infrastructure, I thought I should talk about what we'd learned from that. Um, and what we need to do to build a sustainable export platform in the future. So back to this um, uh, graphic about our supply chain. By working with the basic premise we believe to create this sustainable platform is to work with our supply chain to understand where the influences are from an industry point of view, where the influences are from a political point of view, and then use that, use those relationships 
to get better market intelligence. What we found is that we're very data poor. We think we know what we're doing, but we actually um, find ourselves trying to interpret things from our perspective when we really need to be interpreting things as a whole supply chain. By only by having the supply chain working together can we get enough information to make sure that our strategies are adequately targeted. And so we've worked on developing partnerships back here within our industry. We've got a seafood trade advisory group. We've worked out what our priorities are for our government in terms of what we need them to do, how they need to help us. We've been developing partnerships in China. We've signed, we're have signed. we about to sign an MOU with the China Cuisine Association, which will help us understand and get a lot more market intelligence. Uh, back here, we've been building capacity in our research institutions to help us, once we get that market intelligence, to help us uh, do new product development, uh, put some processing improvements in. We've also developed a safe fish um, program, and that's about providing the technical um, support to our government uh, trade and market access negotiators. So when there's a question about seafood, we've got technical people ready at hand to deal with it. These are all capacity infrastructure issues that we need to build the, the platform from one industry sector. And there's more that we need to do. We need to look at waste in the system. How can we reduce that? How can we um, make better use of what we've got? We've got underutilised species. If we've got a great market intelligence um, platform, we can work out what we can do with some of these species that we don't catch. We need to improve the cold chain. We know that. But the question is, where do we put our money? How do we, where do we, where do we invest in infrastructure? And the problem is, without that data, it's very difficult to work out where to, where to put that money or where to invest. Do we invest it in transport? Do we invest it in improving those rustic port facilities? Do we invest it in improving air freight? Do we invest in skilled staff? Do we invest in technology or communications and a whole range of other infrastructure? Where do we put it? And until we have the data, we can't really make informed decisions. So, my key messages. I believe that the Australian seafood industry is a quiet achiever and that we're leading the premium positioning of Australian food in Asia. That there are transferable lessons, even at this conference, there have been a number of speakers talking about the work they're doing in China. We're all learning the same thing. So how about we talk to each other and we learn from each other? We know the supply chain needs modernisation, but we can't do that alone. The same supply chains, the same guys that import seafood are importing meat, they're importing <coughs> vegetables, they're importing everything, goes to the same guys. So if we're going to improve the supply chain, we need to work together. And this targeted investment piece is really critical. But with the data gaps, it's very difficult to work out where to invest. And my final slide, I think we should stop reinventing the wheel because that bike looks a little bit sad. Um, but sometimes I think that's a little bit like our, uh, our infrastructure. And uh, if we work together, maybe we could uh, make that bike work a bit better. So thank you.